Two of our cameo guests who are also board members of series. Our dear friend, Gina McCarthy, former EPA Administrator and recently appointed CEO of the Natural Resources Defense Council. And one of our newest board members, my friend, a champion in the environmental justice movement, Veronica Eady, the Assistant Executive Officer for Environmental Justice at California Air Resources Board. A warm welcome to you both. Hi, I'm Gina McCarthy, former U.S. EPA Administrator. I'm currently the President and CEO of NRDC, and I'm a proud member of the series Board of Directors, and I am the self-appointed chair of the Mindy Luber Fan Club. You know, series has brought us together because we share the same values, and if we work hard together, we can keep the people we love healthy. We can enjoy a clean economy that works for all of us. We can once again rely on resources that are sustainable and a climate that allows our children and our grandchildren the opportunity to enjoy a better and a brighter future. This virtual gathering is a stark reminder that science matters. And like it or not, we have to follow the science. And at its core, really, that's what series is all about. It's doing what we can to recognize and face the tough realities of today so we can build a better tomorrow. So tonight, let's all thank Ceres for the great work they do. Let's re-engage in our hard work together. Onward and upward, Ceres. Good evening, I'm Veronica Eady. At the California Air Resources Board, I work on environmental justice, developing strategies that reduce the disproportionate air pollution and climate change burdens facing California's low-income communities and communities of color. And as we adopt increasingly ambitious climate goals, the transition to a low carbon economy provides an additional opportunity to address environmental justice. In California, we're pioneering targeted environmental and economic investments that lead to reduced greenhouse gas emissions, while at the same time delivering major economic, environmental, and public health benefits to disadvantaged communities, especially important during the COVID-19 pandemic, which we all know by now is disproportionately impacting these very same communities. Communities where investments occur have already resulted in a wide range of benefits like more affordable housing, cleaner air through zero emission vehicles, jobs, and overall greener, more vibrant communities. Tonight is about rejuvenating us to continue the March for Climate Justice. Five million of us showed up for the Women's March in 2017, six million for the Climate March in 2019, and many millions more continue to march for racial justice in 2020. However, you choose to show up Know that your voice, your vote, and your dollars all go to creating a more just, inclusive economy and society for all of us. Thank you. We're joined tonight by one of my climate action heroes, Christiana Figueres, former Executive Secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Among many accomplishments, Christiana was one of the principal architects of and a driving force behind the Paris Climate Agreement. Prior to hearing from her, we're also honored to be joined by Christine McDivitt Tompkins. After serving as CEO at Patagonia, Chris left Patagonia, the company, to move 6,000 miles south to Patagonia, the region. There, she and her husband, Doug Tompkins, spent more than 20 years conserving and permanently protecting nearly 15 million acres in Chile and Argentina. After Doug's death following a kayaking accident, Chris accelerated her conservation efforts, as she will describe. A warm welcome to both of you. In 2019, we finalized the largest private land gift in history, when our last million acres of conservation land in Chile passed to the government, spurring a public-private partnership that created five new national parks, enlarged three others, in some protecting an area larger than Switzerland. I share these thoughts not with you for self-congratulations, but to preface a simple point and an urgent challenge. If the question is survival, survival of life's diversity, of dignified and healthy human systems, of a livable climate, then the answer must include all of us working with very smart strategies as much and as quickly as possible. Everyone has a role to play in this, but especially those of us with privilege, political power, and wealth. Let's face it, we all know 
that this is the playing field where our futures are largely determined. And this gets to the core of the question. Are we really prepared to do what it takes to change the end of this story? I see young people from around the world rising up to remind us of our culpability, shaming us for our inaction, largely in terms of climate change. They inspire me. If there was ever a moment to awaken to the reality that everything is connected to everything else, it's now. The course of every individual human life is affected by the actions of every other life around the globe. And the fate of humanity collectively is tied, for better or for worse, to the health of nature, encompassing all the other creatures who share the planet with us. We have a common destiny to flourish or to suffer together. Thank you, Ceres. Happy to be a part of this, and I wish you all well. Hello, friends. We all know that we have not had an economic crisis such as this one since the Second World War. But we also know that 70 years ago, we had no knowledge of sustainability and certainly no experience with it. Today, we know that investment portfolios that are kept focused on profit, people, and planet, sustainable portfolios are the only ones that are going to move us forward. And furthermore, over just the last few years, we have developed an incredible wealth of experience of how to build those investment portfolios. That is why I am hopeful that as we emerge from the health crisis, move into the economic recovery, that we will be able to build back better. Not to recover the carbon intensive economy that we had before, but to build back a low carbon, high resilient economy underpinned by much more wise investment. Under the leadership of Ceres, I'm actually quite confident that this is in the end going to be what propelled us forward. Thank you. I have the privilege to introduce acclaimed writer, producer, director, and activist Norman Lear. He's the creator of so many hit television shows, including All in the Family, Sanford and Son, and The Jeffersons. And he's also the founder of the progressive advocacy organization, People for the American Way. Welcome to you, Norman. Hi, and good evening. I'm Norman Lear. Throughout my short, almost 98 years now, I've experienced how storytelling accelerates change. It's about people beginning or imagining a better world and seeing a, a path forward. We're all here tonight because we care deeply about leaving a sustainable planet for our children and for our grandchildren. Lynn and I do. I know Mindy and Ceres do too. What gives me hope is the power we have to make change, to think beyond today and beyond ourselves. Corporations hear your voice because your actions and wallets speak too. For the investors and executives here tonight, your voice is loud. Use it. And for those of you here, because you give to service as we do, keep it up. Thanks for tuning in and keep up the good fight. And for our final cameo, I'm honored to introduce Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland, former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, founder of Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice, and the chair of the Elders. We are so grateful to have President Robinson with us to share a few thoughts. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to take part in this event because I'm a great supporter of Ceres. I've been at a number of physical meetings in the past in different parts of the world, and this is a special time because of the COVID-19 crisis on top of the climate crisis. Uh, we have 
an unprecedented opportunity to move now to clean energy, clean energy technology, also div divesting from fossil fuel and having that world for our children and grandchildren. Uh, I am aware of the injustice of climate change, many layers of injustice in particular that affects, it affects the poorest countries and communities disproportionately. There's also a gender dimension, the role of women in trying to make their communities resilient, but not in many countries having land rights or property rights or having access to capital. So they have to fight harder and they do. And I've become aware of the need not to be optimists in this very difficult situation, but to be prisoners of hope, to use that expression of the first chair of the elders, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And it is those frontline defenders who have taught me about being prisoners of hope. I've seen the devastating impacts, but I've also seen the fight back. And that is what we need. We need the courage now to make the transition, a just transition, remembering also the workers in the coal, oil and gas, which we have to now divest from, but do it in a way that brings them with us to a future where there will be further jobs. So I pay tribute to everyone who is a prisoner of hope in this crisis, because that is what we need. Thank you so much, Mary, for those words of wisdom. And hello again, everyone. I hope you have been enjoying your evening with series at home. It's been really wonderful to explore this new virtual format, which allows us to bring in so many more friends, supporters, and series staff.